And, uh, oh, that's kind of cool. And then an issue. That's an addition. That's good. That's good. Yeah. The lion personality. <laughs> so I want to talk about how to be a dynamite that day, or really um, the seven secrets of a, an effective father and grandfather. I think sometimes we have a tendency to think that once we're done with our fathering, uh, we're done. We're done. But I have learned afresh that that is not the case. That we are, you know, and the fact is I evaluate my own fatherhood and as I evaluate my own um, grandfathering, I was thinking this morning, Lord, what, I can do better. I know I can do better. I can do better at this, this, and this. And so it's kind of putting me back in that mode because when you're a father, um, you have a tendency to always be trying to, at least if you're... You're trying to be a good godly father. You're always trying, because the largest room in the world is a room for approval. And you're always trying to do it better. And how could I say it better? Could I have done that without offending them or hurting their feelings or whatever? So anyway, uh, I'm going to be giving you some really cool secrets here. We have our new computer and a new computer operator. Uh, Hannah is working up at Taylor Reservoir or something like that. I don't know what's going on. So if you have to help him, uh, Sam, yeah. Yeah, you can zero him. Aaron, why don't you take over there? Sam, you go up there and help out if you would. That's good. We get the young guy. Listen, you put the young guys on this thing. And Adam's starting to qualify now to be a geezer. He's getting up there. So, we got the mouse. What's that? We got the mouse. We just want you to live to be a geezer, so stay off that river. Yeah. The, uh, there are over 1,190 verses in the Bible about fathering, how to be a good father, what the Bible says about fathering, grandfathers, the whole shoot man. And so, uh, 1,190 verses. That tells me that God, and God is called the Heavenly Father. He has a father's heart. He also has a mother's heart. Did you know that? God has a father-mother heart. Because only mothers can comfort and do for us Certain things that fathers will never be able to do, right? I think one little boy, they asked him, they said, what, uh, what is your definition of a, of a father? And he said, oh, it's the same as Mother's Day, only you spend a lot less, right? <laughs> or one little boy said, a, a father, somebody's definition of fatherhood is, a father is somebody who carries their pictures where their money used to be. Right? So you kind of, you kind of get that. But anyway, I have, uh, I have done my time as a father. And uh, this gets to be too distracting. Hopefully they can get these up. I got some really good... Uh, there's some in the middle here that I hope they can figure out because it's, uh, it's good. I have a picture of our family uh, somewhere when they were, when they were just... Uh, well, we were, they were just youngsters. And we're all out. We were snowboarding, snowshoeing or whatever. Were we snowshoeing? Were we cross-country skiing? Oh, we were snowshoeing. That's right. All right. So here's your title, Seven Traits of Highly Effective Dads. And I, the seven things are in there for you in the bulletin. And you'll be able to, uh, I don't know if that's distracting you, but it's distracting me. Because now, <laughs> now I can see it back here. See? Oh, you didn't show that. No, I'm going to keep going. I want to get to that one spot if we can. I'll we'll get there. But at any rate, um, could you name... Without saying Bill Cosby or the guy that played Father Knows Best, whatever, a current uh, television father, like a current with our current culture, a good, highly a good example of a father on TV. Can you can you think of that, or are you just in the world today? Can you think of one that comes to mind? I think the last good one that they portrayed was was uh, Tim. Uh, Tim the Tool Man, yeah, with the, with the father, with, you know, with the home improvement. What a great name for a program. Home Improvement. So, can you think of it? Tim Allen. I was stretching. What is it? Tim Allen. Yeah, that's it. Tim Allen. Thank you. But besides that, though, have you noticed? Here's what's happening. We went from father, 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 and oh, by the way, how would this program go over today? Father Knows Best. <laughs> You'd be stoned, man. And some, and even now, some people or girls are like, well, why does Father know best? And why is Father better? And, what? and that's not what it means, right? And when God says, let the wives submit to their husbands and all that, He doesn't mean because you're lesser, you're weaker, you're, no, you're, you're nothing, and He's everything. We are. By the way, I think that women are highly superior to men. 
at being women. And a man is highly superior to a woman at being a man. Viva la difference. Thank God for the difference. Okay, so we have this. Anyway, I'm glad we all trying to live get that self and down there. But let me start you through this. Oh, and, and let me tell you where I got this idea. And by the way, is it any secret that the family is under attack? The family is under attack, and dads and leaders, we're trying to, we're feminizing the role of manhood and fatherhood. And this is one of the things we do in our men's Bible study on Monday mornings. We, we talk about, let's, let's be men, right? We're still men, let's be men, let's be a good example of being men, and let's, we're not going to get pulled into this culture of being effeminate or uh, taking away some of these things. But there was a guy here in 1990 to 94, a man by the name of Dr. Ken Canfield, and he actually did a survey of 5,000 different men. 5,000. On those 5,000, he narrowed it down to 300. What was he looking for? They found a common denominator between a good father, an effective, really good father, and somebody that's just a slug. Just a, you really, you don't have it together. You don't, you don't really have a clue. It's easy to become a father. It's hard to be one. You get what I'm saying? Easy to become a father, hard to be one. And so you just don't have it together, and you really have it together, and you're a good example. So he narrowed it down to 300 out of this group of 5,000 people that he surveyed over a four-year period. Now, out of that four-year period, he came up with seven common denominators on what made a father a good father, what made a father a bad father. I'm not going to give you what makes a father a bad father because I don't think Father's Day should be all about putting you on a guilt trip. I don't think Father's Day should be about, you know, because sometimes we, the, the, and Pat's told me this, we build up the mothers and we tell you how great you are and how awesome you are and then we spank the father, right? Now there's a difference between challenging us fathers as men and spanking them, right? I don't want to spank, I don't want to cause a guilt trip, I don't want to cause any problems whatsoever. That way in your heart, I don't want you to feel uh, like I just am nothing, right? That's not my goal. My goal is to say, listen, these are the seven qualities. Now remember, this is a PhD Christian man who did this survey study to come up with these seven awesome qualities of a good father. Okay? So these aren't mine, these are his. Although, I would agree with everyone, having been a father, I can tell you that when I, when I, if I missed one of them, I was a horrible, I wasn't a very good dad. And there are times when we do really good at one, and then we slip. And so, today dads and granddads, and please understand, I, I'm re rethinking all of this again. Now that I have my grandkids close. And you can do this if your grandkids are far away. It doesn't matter. All right. You're not done if you are a dad. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to give them to you quickly. And then I'm just going to just kind of describe each one briefly. All right? And you can fill these in. You don't have to try to keep up right now. But there's your bulletin. There's a seven step. There's seven places for you to write these down. Number one, they are committed to their children. We'll talk about what that means. Number two, now these are the common denominators out of all those 5,000 people of the good dads. They know their children. They know them. Okay? They are consistent in their attitudes and their behavior. They're consistent in their attitudes and their behavior. Number four, they protect and provide for their children. Number six, number five, sorry that was number four. Number five, love their children, they love their children's mother. What does that mean? They are active listeners to their children. And the last one, they, are, they spiritually equip their children. Now, these are not in any particular order of importance. All right? In other words, this is more important than another or whatever. So, um, let's look at number one. They are committed to their children. Now, I have a great slide. And on that slide, it says, children are, they spell love, T-I-M-E. They spell love, T-I-M-E. It's a picture of a dad walking with his son, and they're going off hunting. They have their guns, and they're going off hunting in a sunset. Why is that important? Because our time is more important. You, your children need your time more than they need your money. They need your time, Dad, more than they need your gifts and your all your fancy toys and everything else. They need your time. 
And I can tell you that with my dad, you know, there were so many things. My dad kind of lavished and spoiled me rotten. I can tell you a lot of stories. You know, a little, little diesel truck he bought me when I was a kid was my best friend. I'll tell you what, it was cool to say. My dad was always giving me stuff. But nothing meant anything to me like spending time with my dad. It's the times on the hunting trail with my dad. It's times riding in the vehicle with my dad. It's times talking with him. And when you, when you have them and you lose them that fast in life, you learn to appreciate them more than ever before. Because you don't know. Let me just tell you. The Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother so that it may go well with you. You may live long on the earth and it may go well with you, right? So if we are to honor them, then you need to think about it right now and think about the fact, well, my old man never was any good. So what? He's still your old man. He's still your dad. He's still your father, which I don't even like calling the old man. In fact, I don't even like when wives say, my old man, or when the, when the husband says, the wife. Like she's something, you know, cast aside. Yeah, the wife. Whatever, it's just my personal thing. But, uh, or the wifey. That's one of my wife just boils. Is this the wifey? <laughs> but anyway. So, um, but time is the absolute most precious thing you have. And let me just tell you, somebody who's lost their dad, that if you have them, now is when you need to show them and tell them. Yeah, well, my dad and I have had a riff for years. So what? Write a letter of apology. Eat the crow. Tell them you're sorry. Love them. But it wasn't my fault. So what? Tell them while they're alive that you love them and you care. Listen, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for your pop. You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be enjoying this earth and this planet and this life and salvation and whatever else if it weren't for your dad or your mom. So that's why we are to honor our father. And so no matter how you feel, Show that on. Okay, do it now. And you only have a certain amount of time to be able to do that. So uh, I just think it's very, very important. So are your children the top priority of your life? Now, last year, I gave you a thing. I showed you a thing called The Resolution. And it came off of the movie Courageous. And The Resolution was a document that men actually, you had, and I, and I asked you last year, I said, read it carefully. Don't sign it unless you mean it. We still have some out on the back table. So if you didn't get one, and you don't have to be a father to sign it, because you'll probably be a father at some point or whatever, or grandfather, doesn't matter. It's a commitment. And let me tell you something. This is something that's what's harder to find more and more and more with dads now is this, the whole idea of being really all in, really committed. And so the resolution makes us read each one and say, okay, before God and before my family, these are the things I agree to do and be in my life. And we actually signed it and posted it. At least it should be posted even in your house somewhere. All right, so here's what it says. I'm just giving you the review of what it said. Because as men, we are to be committed, right? All right, I do solemnly resolve before God to take full responsibility for myself, my wife, and my children. And I said, if you can agree to that, you can sign I will love them, protect them, serve them, and teach them the Word of God as the spiritual leader of my house. I will be... Now, how are we doing on that, boys? I'm seriously, I'm just, I'm just saying. We committed to that. How are we doing? And this is what I've been thinking as a grandfather, all right? You know what? I'm letting my grandkids out, kissing them and tickling them and tucking them in and doing, or doing all the fun stuff with them. But I, when was the last time I bounced them on my knee and read a Bible story to them? You know that's how I came to Christ? My grandma would sit me on her knee and bounce me on her knee and we would read those old Seventh-day Adventist Bibles that you find in doctor's offices. The artwork is amazing, okay? And the value of a picture, right? So I still remember those pictures indelibly to this day, pictures of Adam and Eve and, and uh, you know, all, just all the different stories, the crucifixion and all of it. Remember all of those stories. So I always had those in my mind and that's part of what brought me back to the Lord. Okay, so... I, when I ask the question, how am I doing on that, but that particular one, am I being a spiritual leader to my grandchildren or children? Okay. I will be faithful to my wife to love, to honor her, and to be willing to lay down my life for her as Jesus Christ did for, her, for him, for me. I will bless my children and teach them to love God with all of their hearts and with all of their minds and with all of their strength. I will train them to honor authority and to live responsibly. Now listen, there is a difference between disciplining children and training children. 
If you train a child, you're giving them the why behind the behavior you're asking for. So for example, uh, JC, don't walk out in the street. Right? Don't go, we don't walk out in the street. So you don't just say we don't walk out in the street. I go out and act it out. We run them over with a truck and we show them how it could be, how you could get hurt and the whole thing. Well, that's rather traumatic. Well, good. Isn't it better to fake it out than to have it happen? We don't walk behind cars that can't see you when they're backing up. You know how many kids have been killed that way? So we don't just say, don't walk behind cars. Train. If you want them to turn away from something bad, why? Train them why? Because if you don't do that part of it, they won't be motivated to do it. So that's, there's a difference between training and discipline. I will pray for others and treat them with kindness, respect, and compassion. I will work diligently to provide for the needs of my family. I will forgive those who have wronged me and reconcile with those I have wronged. Have you done that, Pop? Have we? I mean, I'm looking at this going, all right, did I do that? I mean, is there anybody I need to make the right with? City market service counter worker? <laughs> hey, have you ever noticed? I got to thinking about this last week. Have you ever noticed the test that I share with you? You know, I'm always I'm transparent with you, and I share with you where I do good and where I blow it. It seems to be there's a pattern in my life. It's the city market service counter. <laughs> have you seen it? I don't, I don't have a place. Stay away. <laughs> that's, that must be the idea. Well, that's why we start shopping safely. So <laughs> hopefully they'll. But it's really interesting. It's like, okay, if you don't pass the test of the past, you, you don't fail, you just repeat the test, right? Well, I've had to repeat it, and I still keep failing. So hopefully we'll get to that. Number two. They know their children. Okay? This is a slide of a father looking at his child with love and kindness. And uh, Man, I wish we had these slides here because I have uh, some slides of the day in the life of a father with the one wire, right? And it's, uh, it's uh, like 30 slides of this dad and his little girl. You ever seen this? It is the, it is the coolest thing. I'll have to show it to you at some point in some other message because it really is. It turned out really cool. Or they're really, really cute pictures. But anyway, you know your children. Now, what does that mean? In Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way, I think I've mentioned this to you before, but train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart. And uh, does that give you any comfort? I used to think, Lord, this isn't comforting me that if I train up a child the way he goes, when he's old, even if he departs, he'll return. I, why do I, I don't want him to depart. I want to train him, right, so he doesn't depart. Well, guess what? It's real life, and everybody makes their own choices, and they can't depart. But that's really not what the verse is saying. If you really study it in, in the original language, what it actually is teaching is in the sunrise of their life. So in other words, you train up a child in the way he should go. Now Trace is one grandson. Uh, Kason is another grandson. I will guarantee they won't be trained exactly alike. They shouldn't be. Because as in the, in the case of my kids, Jacob was always athletic and fitness and go full on 100 miles an hour. Isaac was the thinker, and it's all about money. Money, money, money. And he was good with it. Okay? And so what I should have done, and I've looked back as a father and said, you know, I blew it because he's made some bad decisions with money. I blew it right there. And I share this with you because I want you to know this so that you can not make the same mistake. I should have introduced him to the right people in his life, good role models, good Christian role models with money, so that he would know exactly the right way to do it and go about it, rather than get rich quick schemes and different things like this. Train up a child in the way he should go or she should go. Jacob was always doing stuff, building stuff. He had to be building things and digging things, and he was always doing stuff with his hands. Isaac, computer. Okay? Now, should I be like, why can't you be more like Jacob? Or Jacob, why can't you be more like Isaac? No, they are two different people. They should be trained. But I have to, here's the thing, dads and granddads, study those children. Because if you study them, you'll know, you know what, he has a propensity to go this way with this. He has a, a real love for this. Artwork. Some kids, they really love artwork. Right? Well, my kid ain't going to be no fruity artist. After all, I'm going to raise him to be a steel worker. Whatever. Right? Theologian. Whatever it is. Don't do that. Every child should be trained according to the way they should go. They like music? Get behind them in it and help them train them in the way they should go. Now, is that, does it mean we don't teach them Bible verses and all that? That's all part of that. But how do you factor God into your daily life? That's the key. 
Let me ask you a question. Do you know your child's favorite car? Their favorite food? That's real easy with some kids, right? With Jacob, and this is passed down. Trust me, this is a genetic thing. Chicken strips. That's it. Ch chicken nuggets. Hey, Dad, can we go out to the really expensive uh, Olive Garden? Sure, you bet, kids. I'll take you to the Olive Garden. We go out. What do they order? Chicken strips. <laughs> for 30 bucks, right? $30 for chicken strips. We could have went to McDonald's and got chicken. Of course, don't eat McDonald's. That's bad. bad. <laughs> Pass on the triple white packs. That's all I'm telling you. <laughs> chicken nuggets. That's all Casey wants to eat. Hey, chicken nuggets, macaroni and cheese. That's pretty much it for Jake. Okay? Not, not Casey. He doesn't like chicken nuggets. He doesn't like macaroni and cheese. I think he's from Russia. I don't know. I think you'll be from America and not like macaroni and cheese, but anyway. Do you know their favorite clothes? Do you know Isaac, when he was little, he would look in the mirror. Now, this is a little bitty boy. I don't like this outfit. It doesn't match. And I would go, there's something wrong. Because that just doesn't, you know, that really, to me, that just does not right for a little guy to be that enthralled with how he looks. And Jacob's is like, off the door was <laughs> Becky's uh, underwear or something. I don't know. What she, <laughs> she was always in a hurry, 100 miles an hour, just go. <laughs> but Isaac, you know, but to this day, Isaac is still very. It's all about the style, right? You got to, you got to. I mean, you got to be pimped out and all that, or whatever it is you call it. <laughs> so here's the thing, though. Uh, you know, if you were gardening, if you're gardening something, hey, now Roy, you can, Roy's got a beautiful garden. Okay. You do not treat every plant the same way, do you? You don't go out and, and you don't dump gasoline on your house, right? And you don't you don't say, well, I'm going to feed this one. Uh, I mean, if, if Jacob put 2,4-D, what's that called? 2,4-D on all of our dandelions, they're dead. But he could have went out there and said, I'll, I'll just use Roundup, that'll kill them. Well, yeah, and everything else around this place would have been dead. Okay? And so you have to know your grass, your weeds, you have to know so that you know how to treat each one. Well, child training and, and being a grandparent is no different. We have, to, we have to know them to know what's going to make that one grow. What's going to make him grow and feel really strong and secure and happy and fulfilled as opposed to this one's going to be different. I got This one I'm going to have to I had to allow Jacob to jump off of cliffs. I did not want him. When he was five years old, there was a high dive at Grand Junction Swimming Pool. And they don't make high dives like that. Remember when a high dive was a high dive? And I'd go up there and it looked like the, you know, the, the pool was about that big around. It was like, ooh. And it took me probably a week of swim at swim lessons to go up and just get to where I could jump off of that thing. And so Jacob goes up there and he tippy toes out and he looks over. And I said, it's okay, son. You don't have to go. Go ahead. You can go back down. And he just does a flip off of it. Five. And I was like, his cheese is plum slipped off his cracker. Something's wrong with my child. He must have dropped him as a baby or something, but he, that's the way he was. All out, full daredevil. Well, even to this day, all out, full daredevil on everything. Scares me half to death. And then he comes back and tells me stories. Yeah, Dad, you should have seen what we did when you weren't looking, right? <laughs> Scares to I mean, I can show you videos of stuff he did that would just blow your mind. But that's what he had to have to be who he is. I couldn't put him in a box and say no. And I couldn't tell Isaac, you have to be more like that. Why aren't you more like that? Can't do that. It's very important that we don't do that. Know your children. Do you know them? Do you know what motivates them? Money, fitness, academics, dance, art? What inspires them? Find out what it is that inspires them. Get behind it and give them good role models. Put good role models in their you know, if I find out that J.C. loves dance, I am going to put her with Michaela, and I'm going to say, you know what, and, and Michaela can show her how to do the twinkle toes and still love the Lord. I don't want her to, you know, to get wrapped up in stuff she shouldn't. So I'm going to give her good role models in her life. Number three, consistent in their attitudes and their behavior. Now I have a picture of this one of a guy that's two-faced. He's got a happy face, he's got a mean face. And he's got a regular face. It's actually a three-faced picture, right? And the thing about this, the idea of this one, is that are we consistent with our mind, moods, and attitudes? Consistently basically meaning they always know what they can count on. I could count on my dad to blister my tail if I did this. I could always count on my dad. I knew he would, I was going to be in trouble, but I knew that he would love me. I knew he would still be behind me. I knew that whatever I did in my life, my dad would back me up, okay, would be behind me. Even if I failed, Dad would be there to help pick me up. Not 
could they count on it? So it's, in other words, what can they take to the bank with you? I can count on my dad when he comes home, I know he's going to be in a good mood. I can count on my dad to know when he comes home he's going to be in a bad mood. Consistency in our life, and they need to not see this up and down thing. And you know, I even had to learn in my life when the kids were little, my moods were like this. And I found out that I had hypoglycemia. And the thing that changed it was learning how to eat small protein snacks throughout the day and drink more water. And I would come home in a much better mood. And it's an awesome thing to walk through the door, Daddy, and have them just plow you into the wall, all of them. That was awesome. I mean, I miss those days. But if I came home like a pit bull, they're not going to come running to the door, Daddy, right? They're going to be like running for cover. So the idea is sometimes you just need to change your diet, dads and grandpas, just to make us a happier, kinder person. I'm just saying, that's just a practical piece of advice. The research shows that fathers that are consistent with their mind, moods, and attitudes are more, this is, and this is what he found, is that out of all these dads, the ones that were consistent were the really effective fathers. They were the ones who really got somewhere. I can always count on my dad to be a certain way, or dad's going to teach me. He's not just going to, you know, just a minute, honey, I'm working on the tractor. And I had a video I was going to show you this morning, too. We didn't get to that. I can do that. You can't do that. I think so. We will close with that video today. So we will okay. have some Because that's a really cool video. And it's his dad working on a tractor. And as he's working on his tractor, he doesn't say to the kid, Be it. I'm busy. He actually says, Come here, son. Come here, come here. Get up there. And the son falls off and breaks his knuckles. And the dad works pretty soon. And the tractor fires up and goes off. And the kid did it. He taught him. He trained him. The kid wasn't a nuisance. He became part of it. I've got a video, a home video, where Becky is under a Volkswagen. And she's as small as JC. If you look at JC, you're looking at Becky when she was little. Teeny tiny, toe head, just like that. And out reaches this little greasy arm. And says, Daddy, can you hand me that wrench? Because she, she didn't have a clue what she was doing. Right there. But she was a part. I made her a part of it. Because I didn't want her to feel like I'm a pain, I'll get to you later. I wanted her to know right now, do, you know, because it's like, you just get under here with me. So what? You get a little grease on you. So what? Casey gets mud grease. So what? That stuff washes off. Let them learn. Let them grow. Okay? All right. Number four. Oh, and I had a great picture for you here, Jordan. All you hunters. Because one of them is, involve them in your hobbies and your interests. And I had a guy with, a, with his son with a great big bull elk laying down, and it was a cool Anyway, protecting and providing. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.8 Anyone who does not provide for their own, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. It's worse than an atheist. In God's eyes, a man who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an atheist. That's huge. Now, think about this for a minute, because it doesn't just mean provide money, provide food. A dad is a provider of love and support and play and, and teaching the Bible. We are a provider. We are, we are one. There's your secrets. There you are. So we are a provider of things that make them feel good about themselves and their... And, and now listen, I'm not saying that as we train them, you know Jeff Foxworthy, what he says. He says, all you young couples believe in timeouts now. That's all you do is time out. He said, my dad believed in timeout. He took time out of his busy day to whoop my tail. <laughs> Seriously. Well, I don't believe in that, that spanking thing. That's a bad idea. Really? What happened to our society from the time that we took that out of schools and out of the country and we started doing what feels good to where we are now? Prison's overcrowded. Now, there's nothing wrong with time out. You just have to learn how to use it together. Okay? All right. So we have the... Uh, and if you look at our Heavenly Father, He is protecting and providing for us every day of our lives. One of the things I think that you need to know about this, and I just challenge you dads and moms and grandmas and grandpas on this, part of protecting is not just, go ahead, try to, you know, you mouth off to my, my daughter and I'll beat you like a grass tire. Go ahead. Kind of like the city market county. But anyway, <laughs> it's not just that. It's also teaching them. Have you taught your children and your grandchildren if there's a fire in the house, this is where we meet. 
People, people die when they don't do that. Have you taught them why it's important to keep the batteries fresh in the smoke of our... What was the last time we changed it? <laughs> we got a house full of grandkids and we have, I don't know, we haven't checked the smoke alarm. But that's, you know, the smoke alarm is a pretty good device. Cynthia uses it for a timer for the turkey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get beaten, boys. Anybody want to have me for lunch? I'm going to call it a day. What's that? Yeah! yeah right. Oh, here we go. Here's some of our, can you, can you make them bigger? I wanted to show you this. These are pictures, these are like the... Uh, a day in the life of a dad with his daughter, when I'm talking about know your children, here's a daddy that spends a lot of time with his daughter, is, uh, but you've got to kind of see the humor in these pictures, all right? So she's dumping honey on his head. <laughs> we'll see if they go, if you can get them fast. I don't know if you can get them fast enough. Change the diaper. <laughs> this is Jordan. <laughs> that was you when you had the first baby. That was you when you <laughs> All right. Yeah, chicken nuggets, french fries, whatever you want. Okay. Um, but that's good. Guide your kids to a faith that lasts. Okay. That's, what, that's one of our last slides with the spiritual one. What did you go wrong? <laughs> Another good one. Oh, the Father's hearts would be inclined to hear me and keep all of my commands always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Deuteronomy 5, 1 and 9. There he is. Spending quality time with your... That's a big old boy, isn't he? Okay. We'll get to that one here in a second. And I'm going to probably just use those, uh, Adam, I'll probably pull those other slides up at another time because there's a bunch of them and I kind of want them to see all of them together because so, they, are, they are rather hilarious. But have you taught your children, your grandchildren, have you taught them the how to do 911? A lot of, a lot of, have you heard these stories where a little four-year-old calls 911 and saves grandpa's life or whatever? It's very important. Teach them 911. This is part of protecting and providing. <coughs> CPR, first aid, teach them this stuff. Self-defense, escape techniques. You know what I think? As fathers and grandfathers, we have the responsibility to teach them groomer's techniques. Now, what do I mean by that? What is a groomer's technique? A groomer's technique is this. Chester the molester comes along in the park and says to your, little, your cute little daughter, um, Honey, could you help me find my puppy? I lost him. Can you imagine what J.C. would do if somebody said, I lost my puppy, please help me? This little girl, J.C. is one of the most tender-hearted children. I don't just brag on her because she's my granddaughter. I'm telling you, if you run out of chips on your plate and she sees it, she's grabbing the bag and filling you back up. She's so tender-hearted, but what if Chester and Lester comes along and says, help me find my puppy? She's gone. It's our responsibility to teach them how we don't listen to that stranger danger and and all that. And I think in the day that we're living in, most mothers are pretty cognizant about that. But but we still, and, and teach them why. Okay? And I, you know, this is one of the things I teach elementary kids <coughs> because I think it's extremely important. How do you get away if they do have you? You need to be teaching that stuff, dads and grandpa. Now, of course, Roy, you're from the old school. You probably hand your granddaughter a sawed off shotgun. <laughs> so. To be a man of velvet and steel, we've talked about this before. To be a man that is strong as steel and a real man. But to also have a velvet side that knows how to play and laugh and giggle and make mistakes and show them how you handle mistakes. And you're very tender. So they need to see in a strong man's man a tender side. This is extremely important. So we need to be a man of velvet and steel. That's what they said about Abraham Lincoln, by the way. That he was a man of velvet and steel. Just think it's important. Number five, love their mother. Now, please keep in mind, these are not my steps. This is based off of a research study. 5,000 men and 300 that did these things were effective. Love their mother. Now, that doesn't just mean, hey, I told her I loved her when we got married. It means they see you be affectionate to her. I, let me just ask you, are you still throwing wood on the fire? Dad, Grandpa, you know, if you want the fire to still be burning after 35, 40 years, you got to keep throwing wood on the fire as we go. Are you still throwing wood on his fire, Mom? Are you still throwing wood on her fire? 
And I'm not talking about passion and all that. That's, that. Of course, that's another part of it, right? And if you want there to be heat in the kitchen or whatever, then you have to start a breakfast or however that goes. Okay? But the point is, is that you throw wood on the fire, you teach them, or your, constant, your children see that mom is a queen. My mother's a queen. And this, I just can't tell you how important this is. That she, that they need to see that you still pull the chair out, you still open the door, you still treat her tenderly. And if you don't treat her tenderly, they see how you apologize and how we make it right. Okay? And this is what effective fathers and grandfathers do. They teach this tender side and they show love and support to the mother. Okay? You know, there's that one old boy that said, I just can't understand why God made you so beautiful, but so ditzy and stupid. And she said, well, it's really pretty easy, actually. She said, you see, he made me so beautiful so you would be attracted to me. Now, why did he make you so stupid? So I'd be attracted to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> you boy can relate to that. Well, okay. Number six, active listening. Now, I didn't just say listen. I said active listening. Here's the difference. If you are on your cell phone and your kids are talking to you, uh, yeah, 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 right, yeah. We do this as husbands and wives. We do this with our children. We're bad about it, all of us, okay? But it's important to be able to say, and we talked about this in love languages. If somebody has the love language of quality time, you don't, so this kills them. This is a slam to that person. But if you set it down and you look them in the eye and you show that they're more important and you listen and you talk to them, now, look, all of us can improve because all of us get into this mode. We're not careful, right? So, or TV, right? Right? Yeah, right. And then it's, we talked about this. We did? I don't remember talking about that. Well, that's because, there you are. Oh, there you are. There's that dad again. What could go wrong with this picture? What could go wrong? Thank you for the comic relief there, Adam. That's good. There you go. Got some more? <laughs> just flash through here real quick. What could go wrong? <laughs> now my family would tell you that's you, Dad. Turkey in the fire. A day in the life of a dad. Don't wait for the perfect moment. Take the moment and make it perfect. Good advice. Now this comes to the last one. When we get to the last one, we're talking about the, the spiritual equipping. Here we have a grandpa. I love this picture. Now this, the light on this slide is terrible, but this picture is, uh, I, I'm going to draw one like this or, or paint one or something of, of almost the same type of thing because I just love the, what this picture tells us. Grandpa knows his responsibility and he's showing them. Now this is why we don't do this and, and this is what the Bible teaches us. Okay. All right, go ahead. Either come home like that or come home like that, but don't 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 throw them off. I recommend coming home like that. Fireworks. What could go wrong? So children learn by example. The idea here is that they learn by an example. Thank <laughs> you. 
So thank you for your patience as we try to figure out how to use our new computer and our new slides. So let me give you this last one. Now just, just keep in mind on the active listening, it is so important that with a child, and when they're little, and I, and I know you probably know this, but I'm going to say it anyway because a lot of people don't. They'll stand there and talk to a kid like this. With a child, you get down in their eyes and you look them right in the eyeballs, face to face. This means everything to a kid. And now I'm on there. If you have to correct them, we're right here. Now, Jacob, when I give, I tell a lot of stories about him because he he was a little different. He was a different duck to raise. Let me tell you, his face, Jacob, Jacob, Jacob. We still have to say Jacob. I can't. So anyway, but the idea is get on their level, really, really. And, and let me, can I just say this? Don't just listen to their words. Listen to their heart. What are they really saying? When they say, that's not fair, why isn't it fair? And to them, why is it not fair? And every moment is a teachable moment. If I've got JC and Casey and they're fighting over a toy, hold it, this is a teachable moment. Hi, lady. <laughs> you look at your grandpa laughing. I'm going to get down and say, hold on, hold on, wait a minute, what's going on? What's going on? Well, she took my toy. Well, that, okay, that's not, that's not necessarily good. But let's find out why, what, what can we do, and we work together so we teach them how to come up with a solution so I don't just say, stop that and bigger. What good does that do? That is not training. You see? There's a huge difference. Well, then the last one is this one. Spiritual equipping. You are their GPS. You are their GPS. And so you are their guidance protection system or guidance planning or whatever it is. Equip yourself to equip your children. If you want your children to have a spiritual mindset and to love the Word of God in prayer, they need to see in you that you love the Word of God and prayer. They need to see it. If they don't see it, don't tell it. If we tell it and we don't do it, we're a toothpaste salesman with bad breath, right? Don't do that. We need, to, we need to be good, authentic spirituality. But then there's a balance, isn't there? Because you can be the overbearing, we are going to read the Bible. And, and that's just what we do in this family. And you can make it a routine, a real, it needs to be fun and lighthearted. And yes, maybe set a time. I know one family, the dad and the dads, we have to take the leadership on this stuff. By the way, did you know the Bible calls you the priest of your home or the pastor of your home? You are the pastor of your grandchildren. You are the pastor of your children. The pastor of your home. What does a pastor do? He feeds, he, play, he, he comforts, he counsels, he guides all a thousand things. And that's what you are to your family. You are the pastor. God has called you to be the pastor. Okay? So, are you spiritually equipping? There's one little boy that said to his dad one time, he said, Daddy, is God dead? And he said, no, he's not dead, so why would you ask that? And he said, well, I don't know, I just haven't seen you talking to him lately. So they're watching. They are watching. I'll tell you one story, and then we're going to close with the video. Stories of a little boy that he, he went up to his dad and he said, Dad, how much do you make? And the dad was a little, you know, he's like, well, son, that's really none of your business. Why would you ask such a question? He goes, well, I just really want to know. Please tell me. He goes, all right, well, if you must know, I make $100 an hour. Good job. But I make 100 bucks an hour. Oh. And the little boy went away sad. He said, Dad, can I, can I give you, can you give me $50? Could you loan me $50? Now Dad's a lot. So you asked me that question just so you could borrow money from me. That's why you wanted to know that. You know what? That is selfish. I can't even believe you would ask me that. Go to your room. So he sends the little boy to his room, and the little boy's up there sitting up in his room. The dad finally starts thinking about it, and he said, you know, I'm not really sure. I might have treated, I might not have handled that just right. So he went up and he knocked on his door, and he said, son, are you asleep? And he said, no, daddy, I'm awake. Can I come in? Sure, come in, dad. So he came in, and the dad said, son, I think I might, have, I might have overreacted on that. I'm sorry. He said, I don't know what you need it for, but here's the $50. And the little boy was so excited. 
Oh, thank you, Dad. And he pulled out a bunch of bills from underneath his pillow. And he was counting them out. And now the dad's getting hot again. And he goes, if you had the money, why'd you ask me for money? He goes, because, Dad, I didn't have enough. I didn't have $100 for the hour. Dad, I have $100 now. Can I have an hour of your time? Can, I, can you come home early and can we play or catch the ball? And can I have an hour of your time? And the dad went into absolute tears because he was like, man, did I blow it. Am I ever blowing it? He has not been my priority. And that is the key to this whole thing. Watch this video and then we'll, we'll close up. <laughs> Who's going to watch it? We don't have to hear it. Yeah, there's no volume. Right here. City Market, I was working for them, and in management. Big money, lots of hours. And you're thinking, well, that was stupid. I mean, you could have provided for your family so much more. You know what I got? 
I got an extra day every week because instead of taking the manager's position, I cut back my hours to where we had to live by faith and we spent our time playing, didn't we? And running and playing with goats and rabbits and chickens and we played and we worked and I would not trade those days for anything in my life. I would not trade that. Now I can have thousands more dollars probably in the bank. I wouldn't trade the time I had with my kids. Jacob and I are both leaking here. You, there's nothing, nothing more important. I'm not saying cut your hours back. I'm just saying that's what I did that I have never regretted. Live by faith, don't be afraid. God will take care of it. 